great start. Oh. We're only four minutes late. <laughs> I know. Good afternoon. Welcome to Boys on Facebook live with Jerry, Jerry Gagne and Gina Gagne. Um, today, this is our 30th show and today we are live from the National Pigeon Association Grand National Grand National Show in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Um, today's show we will be having a few guests on. Uh, we will also be talking about seven um, different unusual pigeons. Um, feel free to post your questions. We will still answer them live throughout the show. Um, any questions you want about pigeons, whether it's something we're talking about or something different, and we'll answer it. And might mention that the birds we are going to be talking about, but mostly showing you, were specifically chosen to show you the variety in looks, the variety in size, the variety in colors, and what makes it really special being here at the Grand National you're going to be looking at some of the best pigeons in the United States and in most cases the best pigeons in the world in those particular breeds. So as Gina said, we're going to be talking about those. We have a, a guest that's going to come in and talk about those particular breeds, uh, we hope. But he's, uh, he is in the middle of judging. Judging is going on right now. And as Gina mentioned, if you're anywhere near Myrtle Beach, come on down here. The show is open. The show hall is free. Come on in. It's open tonight until about eight, and then it opens again tomorrow morning. I would advise if you're coming tomorrow morning, come early because they usually start clearing out somewhere between one and two. And we never mentioned this. You have the opportunity of meeting Gina um, and Jerry. And Jerry. <laughs> and we have a, a large display of the products that we offer for sale. So if you'd like to meet uh, Kim, Gina, or myself, or if you'd like to look at some of these products up close and personal, so to speak, uh, you're more than welcome to come. And if you have any questions about it, you can always call FOIS, and FOIS will give you a little bit more information. Uh, also, um, we're going to be uh, accepting questions, as we always do. So if you have a particular question about your pigeons, whether it's health, um, the loft, baskets, anything that you might want to know, um, just send me your questions in via Facebook. Uh, we start, are we okay? Uh, via Facebook and uh, we'll answer those questions on air. Uh, and you're what makes this show uh, so successful. Uh, there's over 3,000 pigeons here, a couple of hundred different people who are here uh, exhibiting birds or a lot of people come just to look at the birds. So, like I say, it's, it's just a, a great opportunity for coming on down. We're going to be asking Tim, the secretary of the uh, uh, National Pigeon Association, just to sit in for a couple of minutes and tell us something about uh, the show itself. We okay to bring uh, Tim in? Okay. Tim, you ready? Yep. Why don't you sit right over here? Okay. Tim, why don't you just introduce yourself, uh, Secretary of the Treasurer of the uh, NPA, and tell us a little bit about okay. the show itself. Well, I'm the, uh, I've been the Secretary Treasurer for the NPA for uh, the last three years, three, yeah, about three years. And uh, the show here, we've, we've had a real nice show so far. We have about 3,400 birds. Uh, this is the 99th year of the NPA. Next year we will celebrate our 100th anniversary and uh, we're planning a real big show for that. We'll have some special things going on in the show with that. Uh, but uh, the NPA is, uh, I think, is actually growing right now. It's, uh, we're getting uh, a lot of uh, juniors and women that are joining the NPA at this time. And, uh, you know, the membership kind of fluctuates around, uh, but stays, uh, is, is around 14, 1500. It's about 14 or 1500. You know, we'll have, uh, some people that forget to sign up again, but, 
you know, we've got new people coming in all the time, and I see new faces here at the shows every year. So why don't you mention how they can get on Facebook or not Facebook on find the NPA and okay. membership and stuff we have like a couple that. different ways. The uh, you can either call directly to the home office, uh, my number, which is 404-922-4960. Uh, or we have a website, npausa.com, and uh, you can check us out there. It has all the information about the NPA. There's also an NPA website, uh, Facebook page, uh, NPA Members and Friends. Uh, you can look up uh, on that and see up some information about the NPA, and or just ask, you know, post the question on there. Can somebody help me find information about the NPA? And you'll get a lot of replies and responses to help you out with that. I know that uh, in talking about the NPA bands, the National Pigeon Association, uh, this is also going to be a source for you. So if you need different size bands, whether I think they go all the way from four, the doves or? No, no. We, have, we have size six and a half okay. millimeter for, yep. for ringneck doves. And then we have 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14 millimeter. Every size. We're going to be you know, showing uh, a Hungarian house pigeon, and I would imagine that takes a big bang. Those are 14s, right. Some of the really big muffed breeds uh, take those 14 bands. And, uh, Probably you said it was a wedding ring if, <laughs> you, you really, if you forget it. You really could. <laughs> you really could. So this is a kind of an unusual opportunity, uh, and I, uh, I think I shared with you, um, we have uh, as many as uh, over 100,000 people watching the show, so it would make sense that some of you folks are in the general area. So Myrtle Beach, easy to get to. I, uh -huh. The weather's beautiful today, sun it's shining. It's, I imagine nice. it's in the 60s. It's pretty know. nice. Yeah. Right. So if you have never been to a show, always wanted to go to a show, never even knew there was a show, this is an opportunity for you as a pigeon fancier or a person who's maybe thinking about uh, pigeons and had them as a hobby. And I'm sure you hear this all the time, Tim, that people will call and say, I had pigeons when I was a kid and I haven't right. had them for 25 or 30 right. years. Uh, it sort of gets in your blood. I think we, we have, so many people returning to the hobby. Um, I, maybe it's the generation, I'm really not sure, but we have a lot of people coming back and remember the, the good old days. I think a lot of people had them back in the 60s and 70s and early 80s, and now that they've their kids have grown and maybe they're retired or something like that, now all of a sudden they're coming back to the hobby. They're getting birds again. Um, so it's, it's just... Uh, it's a neat thing to see people getting back involved. And sometimes they're getting involved so they can get, their, they can have a hobby with their grandkids. Mm -hmm. uh, so they get their, their grandkids involved in the same way. Going back to, uh, we've talked about this before on the show, but this is the magazine that you would get quarterly, so right. four times a year. Look at this Four thing. times a year. It's full color. It's look full color. A, look at the beautiful pigeons in there. Very um, professionally done. We have, a, we have an editor that does a fantastic job with it. Lynn Gardner. Uh, Lane Gardner Lane takes Gardner. the photos okay. for the magazine, Great. and uh, Gary Romig. Gary Romig is our editor, and he's a professional uh, uh, graphic artist, and just does a tremendous job with laying it out. and And a lot of his artwork appears in here too. He's also a pigeon artist, and so he'll have artwork in here as well. So. Also, might mention that, that look at this magazine, and you would never guess what the the dues are if you've never joined the National Pigeon Association. You get this magazine four times a year. Um, twenty dollars, twenty dollars a year. Twenty bucks a year. You can't buy this magazine and have it mailed to you for twenty dollars. So if you, if you spend twenty dollars just for the magazine, you're honor, you're also to get right. the benefit of a member of the NPA, or it could be well, the other way around. You get to, you get to support the NPA, which we uh, support pigeon-related uh, activities all around the country every year, including the Grand National. This is our big event, but we also support local clubs and, and different pigeon events throughout the year. But you get the magazine, you get a membership card, a membership pin, uh, then there's also discounts if you want to enter birds in the Grand National. There's a dollar discount on your entries. You get a discount if you want to go to our uh, our banquet on Friday night at the Grand National, which is this evening. 
Uh, you get a discount if you want to buy our book of standards. Uh, members get a lot of discounts on things like that in addition to the magazine. The magazine, I think the magazine itself is worth the $20 membership fee. Okay, well, Tim, I do thank you very much for sitting in. Tell much, them why Jerry. you're wearing a mask. I'm sure that I've, the question is there. I've, I've had uh, dust-related allergies all my life. It's not necessarily something just about no. the pigeons, but the pigeon dust does bother me. And when you come to shows, you'll see uh, usually five or six people wearing masks for the dust. But I've got pollen allergies and uh, allergies to sheetrock dust. and Fine particle dust always bothers me. And so I've worn a mask uh, all the time I've had pigeons. It's either that or get rid of the pigeons, and I really enjoy the hobby. Well, so you know, they also come in handy wearing a mask if you want to rob a bank or something. Well, you know, exactly. You, know I mean? <laughs> you never know. You, ne you never know when you might need it. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank taking you, Taking your time. All okay. Right. All right. That was Tim Heinrich from the National Pigeon Association. If you're interested in joining the NPA, please get a hold of them. There's a website. You get on Facebook. Uh, there's so many uh, e easy ways to do it. Uh, 20 bucks a year, my goodness. Uh, what a deal that is. If you have the, li the slightest interest in pigeons, um, consider joining the National Pigeon Association. As I mentioned uh, earlier, if you have a question, like we always uh, do, you're more than welcome to send the questions in. Do we have a question, Gina? Okay. Gina's behind the camera. Um, Veronica normally does that, but we can't talk her into coming to a pigeon <laughs> show. So uh, if you have a question, send it in the way you always do through Facebook, and uh, we'll be glad to answer it. When is the egg fertilized in reference to the spreading of the vent? Read that again to me. Right there. I don't think the spreading of the vent um, area has anything to do with fertilization. That depends on the parents, and uh, if an egg is fertile, uh, you're going to know within um, seven or eight days. Uh, what you can do is candle it, and that just means hold it before a bright light or a flashlight. And if you see veining through the eggs, you know you've got the fertile egg. Uh, and I think that's the question, but in fact, if, if the question is different, you may want to um, uh, send in a follow-up. We'd be glad to follow up on the question itself, um, but uh, the, the question also may be uh, how, well, that wouldn't work, how do you tell a male and a female uh, what some people swear by, although it's not 100%, is the feeling of the vent area. If the vent area is spread wide, where you can get your fingers through that uh, valley, so to speak, then in most cases you have a female. If it's very, very tight, uh, the bones are tight together in the vent, then in most cases we have a male. Like I said, that's not 100%. Thanks for sending in the question. I'm not sure whether we answered it correctly, but if not, please uh, give us a call back. Not a call back. Send in another question. Oh, um, no, I don't think so. We'll just go. Okay. No, we, we had hoped to have John Hepner, the former president of the National Pigeon Association, um, uh, here to discuss the rare breeds that we have. But we'll put that off, and if he doesn't show within the next, uh, f within 15 minutes of the end of the show, then, because we do have them all. Um, why don't you do this? Just take the camera over and just to show them what we're going to do, or would, would it be better to wait until the end? I'm awake. Okay. We got another question. All right. Um, any tips for winter breeding and having better survival rate? I have had about 15 eggs and only two have hatched. Did doesn't say where he's from? Uh, no. All right. Um, Keith, if you could tell us where you're from. That has a bearing on what you call about winter. For instance, back home, it could be in Pennsylvania. Last week, we had six degree weather. Uh, but if you're down in Florida uh, and you go down to 40, uh, the birds are very, very cold because they may be acclimated to the warmer weather. Utah. Utah, okay. Utah, uh, probably very cold. And the question is what to do? Um, any tips for winter breeding and better survival okay. rate? I, can, I probably can give you more don'ts than do's. Uh, a lot of people in cold weather think they should do something about keeping the loft uh, warmer. Uh, I don't, and uh, you should not either. What's the most important thing about 
uh, breeding pigeons at all times of the year, but just as important in the winter time is ventilation. Uh, my the fronts of my lofts are all screened, um, and sometimes I have snow in the loft. Doesn't bother them a bit. Pigeons are at their healthiest, and we've said this before. They're they're, they're at their healthiest in the winter time. They're feathered because they've just come through the uh, molt. The feather is gorgeous. The body is soft and silky. Uh, so that's one of the things. Don't heat your loft. Don't close it all up. Ventilation is just as important in the summertime as it is in the winter time. So be sure to uh, do that. Now, as far as uh, breeding, um, you've got to have, to me, it makes sense to have uh, straw or pine needles or tobacco stems, something in the nest bowl that is going to also hold the heat. Uh, for the young bird, so um, when you have babies in the nest. Hi, Ed Pointer. Uh, he, we tried to get Ed to, to get on the, on the show. He said, ah. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, um, you should have something to retain heat. That's why I use clay bowls. Uh, clay bowl will uh, retain heat much better uh, rather than a plastic bowl. When a plastic bowl is cold, it basically stays cold. Uh, so in the winter time, you want to try to keep your birds, your babies, as young or as warm as possible. In fact, uh, we sell, only people in the United States that sell them, we sell a heated nest bowl. So if you have some very, very special birds and you want to uh, make sure that you're doing everything possible, they're not cheap, but they'll last you a lifetime, uh, you buy a heated bowl, it comes in two sizes, you plug them in, and doesn't get hot, but it stays warm so that your eggs and your babies have a much better opportunity of surviving the cold. But I'll tell you, I raise uh, white racing homers this time of the year, and uh, when we had the six degree weather, I really thought I'd be losing some, and I went out and I had no problems at all. It's six degrees. Um, and the parents were still sitting on the young ones, keeping them warm. You'd be amazed how they can do that, but they really do. So in what to do in the wintertime? I don't think there's anything different than what I've just shared with you. The fertility issues have nothing to do with the heat. So if you have a fertility issue, then what you want to do is stop that. <laughs> We have, we're at the show as you're just tuning in and people are walking by and sticking their tongues out at us and making faces. But as far as fertility, this time of the year, it's the same year round. So um, in reading and preparing for the show, I was, ta I was reading a little bit about the fertility tablets that we sell. Yeah, tablets. We have one for hen and one for cock. And it makes so much more sense because uh, most of the fertility products uh, in pill form, capsule form, are one size fits all. Doesn't make any sense because a female's needs are different than a male's needs. So we have a product for hen and we have a product for cock, one tablet at a time. So uh, what uh, we recommend is if you have a fertility issue with a pair, you buy the hen and the cock tablet and give each one of those birds one tablet a day for seven days. As soon as you see the male chasing, we call it driving, if you see the male chasing the hen around, wants her to go into the nest box, start immediately for seven days. Each one of those birds, hen and the cock, get one pill and I think you'll find your fertility rate will skyrocket. We had another question about a um, guy has West of England tumblers. It's Mick from Canada. Um, he said the pair had babies one time and they're not laying eggs anymore. West of England? West of England. Well, West of England are a heavy feathered bird. Uh, you may have already done it, but uh, they're muffed to uh, trim the vent with a pair of scissors. Just cut the, the fluffy feathers around the vent, so which allows uh, a better chance of the male fertilizing the eggs of the female uh, when they touch. So that's one of the things you're going to do. Now you've got one pair that had a, uh, a successful pair and then from the, no eggs at all after that or eggs that weren't uh, fertile? Never lay eggs after uh, the, that. It kind of puts a smile on my face and I think these are examples of 
one of the, this is going off course, but if you try to call me at home um, and um, you think you're going to leave a message, you can't do it. And that's intentional. I don't want you to leave a message. I just want, the only thing I want to know is that caller ID tells me somebody called at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And if I'm not there, I, I will call you back. If there was a, if you left a message, you're assuming I'm going to call uh, and, and answer your questions via email or whatever. I can't do that because one question always leads to another question, and that answer relieve, uh, leads to another question. So I've got to have some interaction with you. So by leaving the your, only your telephone, I don't have a pre preconceived idea as to what might be wrong, um, and be prepared. When you call me, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. So if you don't know what color the droppings are, find out before you call me. I have to know what the birds are doing. I have to know what have you tried? What medications have you tried? Have you vaccinated your birds? And I know I'm going on and on, but it, it's so important uh, that you be prepared when you call me. Don't call me, and, and this happens. Uh, if you call me and I say what color of the droppings or what's the consistency of the droppings, and you don't know, pretty much the conversation ends there, and I, am, I don't want you to think I'm being mean about it, but I say, geez, uh, John, um, why don't you do this? Are you at home now? You know, or if he's not home, and, uh, when you get home or have access to the birds, go out to the loft and look at the droppings on the floor, on the perches. I want to know what color they are, whether they're light green, dark green, medium green, bright green. I want to know whether they're loose, very watery, what color, could be brown, could be black, could be three shades of green. So there's uh, some important stuff I need to know, and if you've got it ready, I'll get you an answer. Did I answer that okay as best Ooh, I could? Oh. <laughs> are y'all glad he's done talking about that? <laughs> Do we have another question? I didn't think he was ever going to finish. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all for now. Should we tell them the story? <laughs> we're going to tell you a little bit of a story. We're, uh, we're here to answer your question, certainly, and we have things to talk about. But last yesterday, uh, we made the decision, and I must admit I made the decision, let's all go to dinner at 6.30 in this hotel. So we invited some other folks to join us, and they were kind of, everybody was looking forward to sitting down to dinner and talking pigeons and getting to know each other. And, uh, hi John, have you on in a couple of minutes. So what happened was, uh, as I, in fact, John Hepner just walked up, as I was walking down a hallway, I bumped into John Hepner. And he said to me, are you going to the meeting? And I completely forgot about the meeting. So I said, sure, I'll go with you, John. So John and I walked into the show hall. We sat down, and I realized to myself that I can't tell Gina that I'm not coming to dinner with all of our friends are waiting for us. <laughs> and, and it got worse. I lost my cell phone, so they couldn't call me. So they waited and waited at 6.30. Quarter of seven, seven o'clock, quarter after seven, where's Jerry? <laughs> so what they had to do, they called security. Security went to every floor, all seven floors, looking for me, couldn't find me. They went to the restaurant, and they finally went to the desk, and they said, is there any way you can tell me whether Jerry is, check my room, I wasn't there. Is Jerry Gagne still in the building? <laughs> so they, they checked the bill and they found that at 6.01, I had bought a drink at the bar, but they don't know where I am. So finally, I never did realize, Gina said, he said he wasn't going to the show, but I'll, uh, to the meeting, but I'll bet he did. So she went to the showroom and looked in and saw me, so they called off security. I think the next step was a canine dog <laughs> to try to find me. So, so anyway, that's a, that's a story, and uh, it's one of those stories we'll tell for a long time. Uh, what we're going to do now is bring uh, one of the superstars of the pigeon hobby, John Hepner, former president, not just once, but multiple times, uh, been with us a long time, and as a judge, uh, when it comes to pigeons, he can judge just about any breed. Sit down, John. 
John, yeah. what you, and uh, we're looking at that little black dot there. All right. Okay. All right. And if you want to say anything, tell us a little bit about yourself. And what I'm going to do is, while you're telling us a little bit about yourself, I'm going to go get a bird. Sure. And I'll give you a bird, and yeah. you can talk a little bit about each yeah. breed. Yeah. yeah. Sounds okay. great. Yeah. Well, as Jerry said, uh, I'm John Hepner, been breeding pigeons pretty much all my life. My grandfather on my mother's side got me into it. And uh, once I found out that there was pigeon clubs, wow, it was a whole new awakening for me in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada at that time. And uh, so I started raising all kinds of breeds and before long I discovered there was a National Pigeon Association in the United States and I managed to go to one in about 1969 or 71 in Minneapolis of course, I joined it just because it existed and I was hot on pigeons, so why would I not join? And so I bred many different breeds, specializing in English trumpeters and then having up to 65 breeds at one time, usually concentrating on about maybe top five breeds. Some of them have been English trumpeters, English carriers, nuns, domestic show flights, and scandaroons. So we have a scandaloon yeah. to talk about. Oh, out okay, there. okay. Uh, and uh. if you want to contact John, because he's a source of uh, a lot of rare breed uh, pigeons, and John hasn't mentioned that he's also what's called a master breeder in a, a variety of breeds. What, what I'm breed? a master breeder in seven breeds of pigeons, yes. You know, and yeah. so uh, if you want to talk to John, you contact me at Foy's and I can give you some contact information uh, if you'd like to have a discussion or are interested in uh, some of the breeds that are available through John Hepner, uh, you're more than welcome to contact me. So we're going to start out with this breed, John. Wow. Archangel. A gold, gold-breasted, gold-wing Archangel. And what is really amazing about this bird, of course, is the, the color itself, the gold color, and then to have these these uh, bars, uh, really amazing how the feather will be partially white and partially colored. At home sometimes when I take a bird like this, happens to be a bit of a flighty bird, I'll actually pull one of these feathers, uh, which doesn't hurt the bird at all to show how it's partially white and partially dark. But this being somebody else's bird, I'm not going to do that. But. It's a, a quite a common pigeon in Europe, comes basically from Germany. There are many different color variations on archangels. Uh, beautiful contrasts. You have bronze wings, you have blues with gold wings, and so it comes in many different variations. And they have quite a good club supporting this breed in the United States. Okay. Thank you, John. Well, let me let me let me get a more unusual bird. Okay, okay. this is yeah. from the junior section. Though. Oh, okay. Grizzled, yeah. tip, tip. Uh, grizzled. You want what me? I want to do, John, is I want to show you a couple of frames, not show you, but yeah. uh, we're going to do a Hungarian house pigeon. Yeah. And then we're going to go to a real small breed. Sure, sure. Is the scandaroon there? <laughs> oh. My All right. This is the only one in the shell. Well, yes, this is quite a pigeon breed. It is really very large, called the Hungarian giant house pigeon. And it's very big wings, feathers on the feet, and originally came from Hungary, obviously. One of the reasons I've been told, while uh, this bird doesn't seem to be like me, to be holding it, usually I'm standing when I hold it, it's pretty big. Uh, they called it house pigeons because years and years ago, when the country was rather poor, there would be quite a few people that would either steal chickens or steal pigeons. And these uh, Hungarian fanciers so loved their birds, they, th they took them into the house so that they would be safe from any would-be robbers. And so, I always used to think they called them house pigeons because they used to have them uh, sort of roaming around in the porch, you know, part of the house, but the former story I just told you is probably more accurate. I wish I could really set the bird down, 
to show you how big it is. Uh, it is really quite large, and it, it might decide to fly somewhere. <laughs> so we maybe we'll, here, John, we'll, we'll open up the cake. We'll stop that uh, process. Wait a minute. What I want to do, John's holding yeah. a Hungarian house pigeon. Now I'm going to show you the difference that it can. You yeah. can see the yeah. huge, huge yeah. difference yeah. in the size of the pigeons. And there are pigeons that are actually smaller than yeah. even right. this bird. Yeah. So oh. you go you go from this tiny, tiny, delicate bird to this loose feathered, huge, yeah. huge yeah. Hungarian yeah. host pigeon. Yeah. So you can see. All That's through a result of selective breeding. Just like you have tiny little dogs, you have large dogs. Same principle, selective breeding. We have 3,400 birds here at the show, and as I said, if you'd like to come down to the show, uh, we're here at 8 o'clock tonight, and if you'd like to look at these birds, but I wanted to do that as an example that I don't know how many breeds there are here, but I would have ventured to say there's probably 100 breeds yes, uh, yes, or more. Yes. It offers the opportunity to somebody that likes pigeons, just like dogs. My daughter has a little bath home. Sure. But there are other yeah. people that like the German Shepherd or right, the right. Big Bird. So yeah. with pigeons, the, the advantage is hundreds and hundreds of different breeds. You'll find something that you like. Plus the whole idea, it isn't, all you need to start with pigeons is an old barn. Oh, or a, or a little rabbit hutch for that matter. Yeah. If you can start with a rabbit hutch, really quite small. I have quite a few pens to breed a pair of birds. It's only uh, uh, four feet long and two feet wide, two feet high. So it's pretty easy to get started in a small way. Why don't we move over to the Scandaroon? Right. Just, just leave him there for All me. Right. Yeah, see if you'll come here. You can see how unusual that beak is. Uh, and that is a bird originally from the Middle East. There used to be a town called, maybe still is, near Turkey, Iskandarun. And that's where it likely originated. The German fanciers really took to this breed, and in Germany they call it the Nuremberg Bagdet. Bagdet being kind of the word they used in the Middle East, uh, Baghdad. But then the English also became very proficient, and both the English and the Germans really perfected the breeds quite a bit, and they're still getting better and better. But the American birds now are on a par with any that you'll find in Germany as told to us by one of the qualified Scandaroon judges in Germany. So a very unusual breed. People just don't see how you could get such a long curved beak and such a hefty bird with these unusual markings. But a most interesting bird and really enjoyed by many people. Why don't we we'll talk about the uh, tiny owl? Sure. You want to handle it or want to yeah, leave I, it in there? Yeah, I could take this one out. Okay. okay. Now this Chinese owl, first of all, it has a collar. You notice the collar uh, by its neck. When it's standing in a cage, it's sometimes a little easier to see that collar, but it has massive frills. Basically, a reverse growth of, growth of feathers from the, from the chest growing up, and then feathers forming a, a line here, a demarcation, and feathers growing down. And then most unusual, this bird has pants, as they call it. You see these feathers growing the other way? These are called the pants of the Chinese owl. Then in addition to that, they must have these features well developed, but it must stand proud in the cage, not reach or not slouch, but be perky and typey, legs not too long, and that makes for a good Chinese owl. It's a very popular breed in America, very successful specialty club and they always support the NPA. I do believe they actually give extra points if you win at the NPA show for your master breeder points in the club for Chinese owls. How did it come up Great with the name pigeon. owl, John? Well, it has to do with the face. There are so many owl pigeons where they have shorter beaks. There are so many other pigeons that have a much shorter beak than this, like the African owl, for example. 
and people, it's, uh, the head is actually in an African owl supposed to be as round as a ball. So if you're going to be round as a ball, you have, have to have a pretty short beak, and the beak has to sort of flow in with the head, which it does. So that's Chinese owl. This bird is an oriental roller, and this most unusual color is called almond. And uh, it usually has more than 12 tail feathers. It's got to have 14 and be a little wide in the tail. And this bird has to drop its flights while it's standing in the cage, much like this. So uh, it's a flying breed. Uh, originally and there are still quite a few oriental rollers as flyers but there's also a large contingent that breeds them for the show so in the show you want a nice thick neck you want a pleasing rounded face very nice station upright station kind of horizontal with the tails dropped and the tail just slightly up and uh, then a nice neck and a nice head and always posing nice in the cage it's pretty much like uh, the uh, Westminster Dog Show. The dog has to behave properly, or even like a beauty contest. The girl has to pose well, the pigeon has to pose well in the cage. And there's quite a few points for presentation, or style and type as we call it, on so many breeds of our pigeons. And these birds have a lot of points for presentation or style. How do you teach them to be proud, or how do you teach them to show? Well, you you teach them to behave properly in the show pen a couple of ways. One is breeding. As some birds are either wilder, you try to breed the more docile birds, but you acclimate the birds to a show pen. Uh, during the year, one ought to put his best show prospects into a show cage to get the bird used to the show cage so that it's not its first experience when it goes to the show. So often in my case, I have so many breeds of pigeons, I want to just see what I've all raised and I'll bring out the dragoons one day and look at them so they get put in the show, maybe six of them. Then I may want to look at some English trumpeters and I bring them up to the cage. Then I might bring some nuns on a long afternoon to enjoy these birds. But in the meantime, they're all getting show prep, show training, because and that will happen again several times over. So birds kind of get used to that. That's number one, but uh, the breed, the trait for showing is also bred into the bird. There's some birds that just want to be typey and perky and show well, and there's some other birds that want to be kind of laid back. And then you will try not to breed so many birds from a laid back bird, but breed the typey and the perky type of bird that you're looking for. I think this will be the last one, Ron. Do you want me to take it out? Or? Well, if we can get a close shot no, from this. Can. yeah. And it's this, blowing, too. This is an English powder, and as people come down, I've raised this bird for years. They just can't believe what this bird will do. First of all, it has very, very long limbs. It really developed in Scotland and England. I want to, to uh, take it out and show you one of the most unusual things you've seen in pigeons. So. This is a pigeon that they want a very slim waist on this bird. Just like as on a model, you want a slim waist. And the limbs are very long, but this bird also uh, performs by having air in its crop. And they will do this naturally, but it doesn't hurt them at all for one to blow them up like a balloon. And I've had so many children and just be amazed when I do this for them, which I'm going to do now. It's really quite easy. There it is. So it can hold it in or it can let it out or sometimes I can force it out either way. So. English powder, very stately bird, very, very popular in England. It is too bad we can't set them down in the show on the table and show you how elegant and tall they are. 
really tall. So I think maybe that'll do it for a while. That's it. Yeah. Well, John, thank you very well, much for taking right, the time. Right. I know you're busy. I, I enjoy doing yeah. it. And if I you appreciate it, yes. Think about the National Pigeon Association. We need members. Yeah. It's so inexpensive to, to start. People will help you if you want a particular breed. They'll tell you about the breed. It's not like chickens where you need a backyard or a large pigeon right, coop. Right. You, in fact, the way I started, so many of us quit pigeons for a while and raised our family and then got back in. I did that, and I've shared this with you before. One day, I was on a roof. I sold roofs. I was on a roof and I looked next door and this has been 25 years since I had a pigeon and there was some racing home. Okay. And I said to myself, I'm not going there yeah. because I know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. My heart's going this way. <laughs> Don't you know, it, it, fate I suppose, the man next door saw me on the roof and he waved to me. He said, come here. Yeah. So I went over. He said, I need a price on my roof. Okay. He said, would you give me a price on our roof? And being a salesman, I, you always need something in common to sure. talk about. Sure. I said to him, you know, I used to have pigeons. And he said, did you? To make a long story short, I sold the roof for $10,000. And I paid $100 for a pair of <laughs> racing helmets. And I took them home. And I, my wife said, what are you going to yeah. do? No coop? No yeah. cage, nothing. Yeah. But in a matter of half an hour, yeah. I had some chicken wire and I put it over a couple of shells. Oh. I was back yeah. in the pigeon business. Thanks so, again, John. So, so let me tell you a quick story that relates to how I got back into pigeons. I'd had them as a kid and then went to college, got married, and found out about pigeons in Winnipeg at that time and went to visit some people. I didn't have any loft, no place to put the bird, but I so fell in love with a blue and white African owl that I bought it, took it home, and went to our uh, one, maybe two bedroom apartment, went to the living room and took this bird out and set it on the ledge of the window and had my wife come over and take a look at it. Well, this African owl cock saw the image of himself in the, in the window and so he starts to coo. So of course, as he is cooing, the image is cooing more, and he put on a show like you wouldn't believe. So there I had a bird, I had him in a cardboard box. Fortunately, my folks-in-law had had chickens, didn't have many more, but I managed to start raising pigeons when I was about 21, again, in Winnipeg, after I fell in love with that blue African owl. Thank you, John, appreciate it. Hope you've enjoyed it. Well, we have 15 more minutes. If you have questions about the hobby, about John Hepner, about pigeon diseases, just get on Facebook, send us the question, and we'll answer the question here on the air. So, we're going to go back, and I do have some questions to answer. Thanks, John. Okay, you bet. I wanted to mention a couple of things because over the last uh, few weeks I've been doing some research, and as I think I might have shared with you, we are uh, working on a book on the health of pigeons. So. I've got a call the last two or three weeks from pe different people, and it happens to me. So I had to do some research to get an answer, and I did that. You will on occasion have your birds, maybe one bird, maybe two birds, maybe the whole flock, eat grit like it's candy. Just eat grit, and you fill the grit pot up again. They eat it all. You fill it up again. And, it, and with me, I use red grit, and before you know it, their droppings uh, on the floor are all red, but they just keep eating it. So they wanted to know, will that harm the bird? Why is the bird eating so much grit? So I looked it up, and uh, I spoke to Dr. Botha from South Africa, who is a world-renowned veterinarian. I've mentioned him before. Hi, Gina. Hi. Welcome back. Thank you. Nice, nice camera work. <laughs> <laughs> so, Oh, by the way, we apologize. We were late again. <laughs> we were so happy that at 10 minutes to 3, we were ready to go. And Gina, we're, we did a test and it worked and everything was fine. Gina gets up. She says, oh, my God, I forgot to turn the camera on. So, <laughs> so we were late again. But getting back to the grit, um, th there's a disease, well, there's two of them that could cause this, and I never knew it. So I thank you folks 
for uh, sending in these kinds of questions. I learned from it too. Dr. Botha said the most common cause for that, which really surprised me, was a low grade infection of canker. No, I w how do you, re I just never would have tied those two together, canker and eating a lot of grit. But he says a low grade uh, disease, a low grade outbreak of canker will do that. But he said the most common is something called candida, or some people call it thrush. And once again, we've talked about that before. Um, and so if, if, it's, uh, if you're eating grit like it's going out of style, or, uh, then you may have a, a case of candida. Some people call it thrush. You'll know it's thrush sometimes. You look in uh, the throat and it's red and inflamed. Or it's a strange thing. You'll see your birds stretching out their neck, like trying to make the neck longer. I don't know why, but it stretches out their neck. Uh, sometimes you'll see a frothy slime in their throat. So there's various ways uh, to white, recognize the fact that you have it. Go white, ahead. Like white dots? Yeah, that's right. See, you folks uh, don't think Gina or the girls at the store know pigeon diseases, and we've laughed about this before, where people will call and ask Gina or Kim or Vicki or Sherry. Um, uh, they'll describe the disease, and the girls will tell them exactly what the problem is, and invariably, well, do you mind if I call Jerry? <laughs> they call me and they get exactly the same answer. So uh, believe me, believe the girls. Just like I forgot to mention that thrush is usually recognized with some white dots in the mouth, on the roof, or in the throat. So um, some, another th sign of it, and I've had this question too, they've eaten, but you go back the next day and they haven't had anything to eat since then, but the feed is still in their crop. It's not completely digested. That could be a sign also of candida. So, treatment. We sell a product, as do others. I don't want you to think we're trying to sell your product, but um, there's a product called Candy Statin. And the, the important one is statin. That's neostatin, which is a rare drug to be able to find in today's world. We have to bring it in from overseas. So, Candy Statin uh, is, goes in the drinking water for seven straight days. Then you're going to treat them with probiotics, a good probiotic for three days. Then you're going to switch and you're going to put them on metronidazole. Metronidazole is a, what's your treat? Canker. Canker. <laughs> <laughs> so now we, we've gone to first, we've gone after the, uh, uh, the thrush and with the probiotics to rebuild the good bacteria. Now we're going to go seven straight days with metronidazole which is a canker treatment, and, you go, and then after those seven days, um, what you're gonna do is give them three more days of probiotic. Now, in talking to Dr. Volta, he suggests, yes, it is water-soluble, and you can put it in a drinking water, but he says, if you have the ability to do it, uh, don't put it in the water, put it on the feed. He said the reason for that is it is a, a better dosage control, and it's more effective on the feed than it is in the drinking water. So, if you ever had that experience where your birds are eating grit, eating grit, they just, they can be hungry, not fed, and you put the grit out and they go right to the grit, then you may have? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Where'd you go? You're like a wander. Oh, we have questions. No, I was looking at the questions and kind of. Okay. So, if hung. you have a question, once again, if you want to send it in via Facebook, how do they do that? They know how to do it. Just they know how to it do it right on the feed. Okay. Now we're going to talk oh, about another. Is too. Uh, uh, this is how I do my Excuse research me. a half an hour before the show. What do you? I'm sorry. Your wife know? is watching. My wife is working. Oh, watching. Oh, watching. Hi, sweetheart. We've been away <laughs> since Wednesday. When did we leave? Wednesday, Wednesday morning. morning, and uh, won't be back until Saturday night late. So. Thank you for watching. She, um, she one, said I look tired. I'm tired, <laughs> very tired. Uh, well, I took a nap this afternoon, so I'm doing okay. I wanted to talk, we talked about this before, but once again, uh, re doing a little bit of research, refreshing my memory, I wanted to talk about something called ornithosis, which is? One-eyed cold. A one-eyed, you gotta speak up. One-eyed cold. Yes, ornithosis <laughs> is a one-eyed cold. 
And then a gentleman had called and talked to me about how to treat one of Foch's. And in the research, I was reminded that one of Foch's, one eye cold caused by chlamydia, is a disease that an individual or a human can actually catch. It's rare, but it does happen, and you end up with pink eye. So in my su in the suggestions, because in treating it, it you're going to be putting um, one drop, one eye, one time right into the eyeballs. You're going to um, maybe treat the whole flock with the most effective drug would be doxycycline in the drinking water, followed with three days of probiotics. But my suggestion is if you're going to handle the burn that has an ornithosis or a one-eyed cold, wear the, the latex gloves or rubber gloves or something like that. Now, I'm telling you to do that, but to be perfectly frank, I've never done it. I've had one-eyed cold with patients, and I want to I want to emphasize that it's rare. Don't think because you have a bird with a one-eyed cold that you're going to get sick. But the minute possibility is there. Do we have any other questions? No. Where are you folks today? We usually have a half a dozen questions. Oh, I know. They're all in their car coming to the Grand National <laughs> in Myrtle Beach. <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to say, young lady? No. Nope. Why not? I'm tired. Oh, you're tired. Well, have a you want to be excused? Oh, no. no. You, you can stick it out. we got about six yeah. more minutes. Okay. Since we are at a pigeon show, uh, I know a lot of folks out there do show their birds. They may not be here, but there's pigeon shows all over the United States just about every week, every weekend from the fall. And this traditionally is the last show. There might be one more show somewhere, but tra traditionally we are now transforming from show season to breeding season. So one of the things I wanted to mention, if you do show birds, you have to keep in mind that even though you may have ac they may have access to water at the show, they become dehydrated very quickly from the transportation, from being in this show, um, in this environment. It's completely different than what they what they normally. Uh, I'm laughing because the guy is laughing at me, and I can't stop smiling. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, what do you do when you take your birds home? in your baskets and you take them home uh, the next day after the show give them a coxie worm tablet okay it's very important to give every bird that you showed a coxie worm tablet once again it's a brand that we sell but other people may sell the same brand or a product that is very severe uh, it's got trimethoprim sulfur is it or is that the avio car okay anyway a coxie worm tablet and then while well, you've got the bird in your hand and you've dropped the tablet down its throat, what you want to do is put a couple of drops of one eye, one drop, one eye, one time in each eye uh, to prevent the possibility of uh, respiratory. But if you do sign, show a sign of a respiratory issue, what you then want to do is put them on right away, seven days of a respiratory drug. The, uh, best one would be Spiridox. Spiridox comes in powder, but it comes also uh, comes in tablet form. My suggestion to you is use the tablet because you show you didn't show all of your birds. You just showed whatever you're bringing home before you put them back in with the other birds. Drop. Um, also, you can treat them with uh, for respiratory with Spiridox. So Spiridox comes in tablet form, powdered form. In this particular case, uh, I think I might. Uh, put it in a drinking water, treat all of the birds, because if they are carrying a respiratory issue, it's going to treat the affected bird, but it may also spread a little bit, so I'll put it in a drinking water. We have several questions now. Oh, we have several <laughs> questions now. Um, Mike asks, how do you become a san san sanctioned judge? Um, unlike the, uh, um, the AU, or unlike other chickens uh, there is no school but one of the good things about joining the national pigeon association is you can be mentored and the way you're mentored is first of all you make it uh, you have to have pigeons for a little while you can't get into pigeons today and be a judge next week it takes a number of years of mentoring mentoring means a recognized breed judge 
John Hefner, who was just with us, is an Albury judge, which is very rare. He can judge anything. But there are a lot of specialty judges. One might judge only fantails, and one might judge uh, racing homers or Mordiners or King. So what you do is you make it known that you want to be one. Join the National Pigeon Association and uh, ask, make it aware, make people aware, and you'll find they'll be very, very pleased uh, to have you as an upcoming judge. Because most of our judges are getting older. They still have the ability to do it, but we need young judges coming in. So that, in answer to your question, that's the basic the way to do it. And if you um, uh, want more information, contact me at home. My home phone number, 724-359-5355. Uh, if you didn't write it down, all you have to do is contact Foyce. And if I'm at the store, I'll answer the call. If I'm not, they'll give you my home phone number. Good job. Pardon? Good job. Well, thank you. You're about as quiet as they ever meant, ever saw you on one of their shows. I know, you're, you're, you're tired. My head hurts. And a headache. Um, and there's a pain in the walking by right now. <laughs> Question. Um, Why are oh. you coming up with that? Because we know a lot of people tune in late. We are at the Grand National Pigeon Association, one of the most, uh, one of the biggest and highly recognized and go-to shows in the United States. We're in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina shows at the Sheraton. It's free to come in. If you want to come in and talk pigeons, you're going to see we have over 3,400 pigeons here today. It's free. Come on down um, and walk around and have questions. People love to see people coming in that don't know. They want to teach you. They want you to become a member of the National Pigeon Association and most importantly, enjoy this great hobby. Go ahead. Um, are we having an auction for the next show? Not this show. Next show? The next yeah. one. And we are going to have an auction. In fact, John Hepner, who was on earlier, uh, told me he's going to give me some birds. Uh, we have some fantails coming. So, yes, we definitely are going to have an auction. I can tell you there will be at least one pair of top-quality racing pigeons, uh, and then there will be some top-quality... Uh, and that's some, I want to emphasize that. I don't accept, for want of a better term, junk. If they're not good quality pigeons, I don't want them on the auction. So when you buy birds from our auction at reasonable prices, you're going to have top quality pigeons. So yes, we will have an auction. And if you've never seen our auction, we run the show, and we're at a little over 4 o'clock now. But it starts generally at 4 and goes for 15 minutes. And you also have the option to get on Facebook, and uh, Veronica will post pictures and tell you what bridge will be at on our next auction. Is there anything we missed? No. Nope. Is it time to say so? Mm, no. So, uh, no? We have a question? Another question. Okay. Richard, I'm not sure what you're asking. You said, when do the birds of prey do not strike? Okay, I do understand. Do not that. strike? Yeah, it means time. when when are they a pain in, when are they not a big pain in the ass? She, okay. I, I'm allowed to say that, aren't I? Yeah. You can say anything you want. Most uh, hawks are territorial. You're going to have probably your biggest problem uh, in the colder weather come around October, November, December. Hawks migrate, and the birds up north of us are now going south in most cases. So that's when you're going to have your biggest problem. I lock my birds up usually somewhere around October and don't let them out until about March because I can let them out and I've seen it happen with my own eyes. Uh, I got my white pigeons flying, boom, there goes one white pigeon. I chase, sometimes I chase the hawk down to try to save the pigeon. So the time to be most concerned about hawks is in the winter time. The time to be least afraid of hawk hit is summer, but as, as I said, they're mar they migrate, but every area usually has one hawk who stays in that particular area. <laughs> it's just, it's like it's his own private territory. He knows you have, you have pigeons. He usually knows approximately what time your birds are going to fly. Uh, so he's in a tree waiting for you. So my advice is stagger the time. 
Don't let your birds out all at the same time. Stagger it so the hawk will be visiting you at 8 o'clock in the morning and he's going to say to himself, where the heck are they? And he's going to get hungry, so he's going to go to another point where there might be chickens or martyr pigeons. He circles his territory on a regular basis. Thank you. Now is it time to say goodbye? It's Do we have another time. question? Nope. No, no more questions. I was telling Gina earlier, Gina and Kim, Gina, Kim is manning the booth. Uh, if you want pigeon supplies, come on down. We've got them here. <laughs> but now, just as I was going to tell you, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, that was the story I was going to say. I better not. We're going to say goodbye. So our next show will be February 8th. Um, we will be back home then. February 8th, we also will be having an auction that day. So show starts at 3 p.m. and then the auction starts at 4 p.m. and that's all eastern time because we know uh, and I we've shared with you uh, we know that the people are watching from all over the world we had 103,000 people watch one of our shows uh, 50 to 80,000 is not unusual so uh, it's caught on people are asking questions and we invite you never feel um, like you, you have a, a dumb question or something, the only dumb answers, you've heard that before. But the question that you have is probably in the hearts and minds of another hundred or a thousand readers right. who haven't asked that question. So if you have a question, you can uh, send it uh, to us on Facebook. But if you don't want to wait, what I do a lot is people will call me at home and ask me health questions, just like I did here. I write the question down, do a little bit of research, answer it for the caller or the email and uh, then it pops up on our show so uh, we urge you if you have a question a concern or, or anything you want to know about pigeons or oh i know what we didn't have i'm sorry i scared you what did we not do i know do? we didn't uh, have we, we have a, a feature we forgot you can we're going to give anything. we're going to give you five minutes you have you can ask anything you want about me, about Gina, about, it can be pigeons, but no, it can't be pigeons. Nothing about pigeons. And nothing about pigeons. What would you like to know about me? What would you like to know about Gina? Anything. Anything. Not just well, us. Some people yeah. call and ask, how did you get in pigeons? Some people ask about their pigeon coop, but things like that. It's not pigeon health questions. So you've got about three or four more minutes if you have a question and want to ask that question, just give us a call. Once again. Not a call. A call. Uh, Just post it. Post it. Yeah, they know, <laughs> why, they know what the hell I'm doing. Uh, we thank the folks who have uh, donated the pigeons. Uh, once again, don't mention it much, but the show is brought to you by Foy's Pigeon Supplies. Our uh, phone number is 724-843-6889. Do we have an 800 number? We do. Oh my, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I Go forget ahead. what it is, but I'll 877 355 7727. Does that sound right? Uh -huh. Wow. How about that? Yeah. Well, we're waiting. you got two or three more it's minutes. Ask right. anything. We have this little booklet, and it's little. You can see it's not much. Cost you 10 bucks. But it's years of research by myself and the results of calls by you. It will expand as time goes by, but it's called Top Secret Pigeons and Tips from Me. So if you are interested, for 10 bucks, we'll send it along to you. Probably the shipping is what, three or four bucks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, four dollars shipping, just like our vans. We'll send it to you. Or email um, it. Or, you know, or we can email, yeah, that's right. We don't have to mail it to you. If you have a computer, we can email the whole book to you. And there's all kinds of hints and suggestions and tricks uh, a little bit about health. So if you're interested, contact Foy's Top Secret. We got some questions. All right, got a question. What age did you start in pigeons? I told the story, I'm assuming he's asking me. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> duh. <laughs> I told the story, in fact, I was talking to somebody about it today. When I was about 10 years old, um, I was much smaller than I am now. In fact, when I graduated from the eighth grade, I was 87 pounds. So in, in uh, the lower grade, I was just a skinny little one, short. And uh, even back then, 50, no, actually, almost 70 years ago, there were bullies in every school. And the bullies never picked on anybody else 
that was their size, they always picked on the skinny little runt, and I was the skinny little runt. And one day, and, and uh, this is no reflection on, on anything, hi Martha. <laughs> <laughs> the fellow, there was twins, and they were called by everybody in school, the Herman, the German twins. Well, the Herman, the German twins always chased me. For, and I, that was my only thing. I, they were bigger, but I was faster, and I could duck and die, um, and they only caught me once. But as I was trying to escape from the Herman the German twins, I took a different route and went through somebody's backyard. I, it just meant to be. As I went through the backyard, I noticed this two-story building, and it had wire, not windows. And there were these birds flying around and I slowed down and like I say sometimes it's meant to be. I slowed down and I was looking at the birds curiosity. I didn't even know they were pigeons and John Higginbottom was the owner. Now I'm 10 years old I still remember this to my day to this day. John Higginbottom was in the loft not in the house. He saw me. He says can I help you? I said no I'm just looking at the birds. He says come on in and I've had pigeons since that time. So I've had pigeons now were going on 68 years. Um, couldn't imagine a better hobby to have, and we're such lucky people. Uh, I built my hobby into a, a business, and there are seven employees, five of which are family, including my daughter Gina, uh, my daughter Kim, my granddaughter uh, Sam, my wife Vicki, and did I miss anybody? Sherry and Veronica. Uh, we have two adopted daughters, <laughs> Sherry and Veronica. Thank you very much no, for looking. We oh, we have, have another, another question. question. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> Who do you want to win the Super Bowl? The Rams. <laughs> the hell with them Patriots. He, he won too much already, uh, but never bet against him. That quarterback, if, if I had to bet, I would suppose it would be on the Patriots. But who do I want to win? The Rams. Are we done? We're done. That's Ask Anything from Gina and Jerry. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll talk to you in two weeks. Now she has to get up and physically shut this off, so I'm still on the screen until it goes blank. Thank you very much for watching.